So Rich. Yes, John. Did you know we've been making videos for six years? Yeah, I've been here for all six oh. of them. <laughs> okay, just checking. Because we have never done a build a PC video, and I think it is time to change that. You know what? You're right. So what do you have in mind? All right, I'm thinking we should do a $1,000 PC and show people how to build it from start to finish. What do you think? You mean you don't want to do some sort of bananas $4,000 PC build where Jay's two cents jumps up from behind the counter with a 4090 in hand and goes, look at this! Well, while that would be awesome, we don't know Jay's two cents, and this is a budget build, so that's not what we're going to do. Yeah, that checks out. I'm down for it. Let's do it. All right, so your first question here is probably going to be, how do I choose those parts? This has already been solved for you thanks to PC Parts Picker, who we are not affiliated with, but we think is a great tool. PC Part Picker helps you stick to a budget while also checking the compatibility of the different components, including how much power you're going to need when choosing that power supply. So. Let's take a look at the components. Welcome to the parts section of the video. Let's talk about the components we are putting into our $1,000 PC build. Starting with the foundation, let's talk about the motherboard. This is a MSI Pro H610 M-G Wi-Fi DDR4. DDR4? Why DDR4? Because DDR4 is cheaper than DDR5 and DDR5 would put us way over our $1,000 budget. DDR4 is still great, guys, it was great a little while ago. Yes, the new hotness is DDR5, but DDR4 is going to do us well and last us a long time. What are we putting on that? Well, we're going to put in an Intel i5-13600K CPU. Why an i5? Because it is the right price break between performance and value, and i3 is more value than performance in the i7s and i9s. Well, that's firmly in the expense of performance range. This guy needs to be cooled. What is going to cool that CPU? Well, we're going to use a Hyper 212 Black Edition from Cooler Master. Just a good old fashioned, well-built HSF, and it's gonna keep that shit cool. We talked about DDR4, let's talk about RAM. We're gonna put T-Force Vulcan Z DDR4 3200. This is 16 gigs. 16 gigs is the sweet spot to keep your games running and give you enough overhead left for your OS without compromise. Go with 16 gigs, it's the right level. And the thing that John says is the funnest part of the build, right here, ladies and gentlemen, this is our GPU. This is a Zotac. Twin Edge OC Edition GeForce 3060 card. No, it is not a 3060 Ti because we couldn't make that work under $1,000. This guy's got plenty of power and performance to play all of your Fortnites and your Call of Duties all day long. This is a good value vehicle. Vehicle card. It's a vehicle card. It's a vehicle for playing games. Zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom. Last, the power. We're going to use a Cooler Master MWE 550 watt power supply, 550 watts. Plenty of power to run all of this, plus a little extra budget for in case you decide to upgrade in the future. And again, good price point, good power supply. Last, but it's not here, is a case on the ground. You'll see that when we build the PC. That guy is too big to put up here. It's just a nice all around value case we'll talk about in a bit. With all that said, John, are you ready to build this PC? What about storage? Oh, there's storage. Storage. Storage, ladies and gentlemen. So when John and I were planning out this build, we were thinking about whether we go with a with a kind of like a, a slow, large mechanical disk and a small, fast SSD. And what we actually end up deciding on is this right here. It's a single one terabyte swordfish, swordfish <laughs> from ADATA. This guy is got enough space for you to hold your games and your OS, and you don't have to worry about having multiple storage targets. Thank you for reminding me, John. All right, let's build this thing, shall we? First things first, people, make sure that wherever you're building your computer, that you're not doing it on carpet, that it's a very low static environment. We're using a Two Guys Tech play mat here, and we've got it on our counter. That being said, our first thing we're gonna do here is we are going to basically prepare the CPU cooler to be mounted, throw the CPU into it, mount the CPU cooler, throw the RAM into it, do all the things we can do outside of the box before we put it into the case, just to cut down on the amount of painful stuff, and this is easy to do. So let's get to it. Let's pull this guy out of our bag. This is our MSI motherboard. For those of you who are not really familiar with motherboard components, let's just quickly talk about what we see on the board here. This is the socket where the Intel CPU will go in. This little black thing right here is actually just a protection to protect the, the basically the pads that are underneath here from getting bent up so the CPU doesn't work. This is our single PCI Express 16X slot where our GPU will go. Two DIMM slots here for our two sticks of RAM. This is an ATX power connector. This is an auxiliary 12 volt power connector, which is required. Um, it's additional power for the board. There are SATA ports here. This is a USB 3.0 header. And 
this little guy here, which you may or may not have in your motherboard, is gonna be our built-in Wi-Fi card. This back area is the IO port cluster, and we'll put that, we'll talk about more about when we when we put it into the case. And that's basically it. So, oh, NVMe slot. That's where our NVMe uh, solid state hard drive is gonna go. Otherwise, that's all there really is basically to the big parts on here. Let's start putting it together, shall we? Our Cooler Master heatsink fan here needs to have the support bracket installed onto the motherboard before we can use it. To do that, and this is a LGA 1700 pin socket. So there are, just for funsies, all of this extra stuff here. This is for all of the other sockets that Intel and AMD makes. So this CPU cooler from Cooler Master supports literally everything out of the box. So in our case, we just need this guy here. So that's what we're gonna use. Let's get her installed. We'll flip this guy around. We've got these little holes. They're gonna pass through like so to the back. Flip this guy over and send it back down. Basically what we need to do, um, and we will take care of that in a second. We're gonna leave it right there for right now. Let's get our CPU in. What we really care about is just our CPU. That is our 13600K CPU. It's gonna go right here. Popping this out is pretty easy. You push down on this little bar here and see I'm moving it out like this. Pop it up. Doing so will release and show us this is that 1700 LGA grid and our chip. It only goes in one way. So and you can pay attention to this. You look here, you'll see there are notches on the edges of this. By the way, you can't put it in the wrong way, so don't try. If it doesn't go, the, the secret to computers is, if it doesn't go in right the first time, don't push it harder. Okay, once that guy's nicely seated in there, we're gonna drop this down, and when we push it down, you'll see that this piece of plastic pops up. It might seem scary, but you're just gonna set this guy in and push it down, and it's retained, just like that. That's done. Next thing to do is for us to put a little thermal paste on top of it and then mount our honking cooler. John and I have differing opinions on how to do this. I am a big fan of doing a full spread. So we'll put a little bit in the middle like this. All right, my favorite thing to do is to evenly spread as much as possible the thermal paste across the CPU. Thermal paste's whole job is to fill in any spacing and gaps you might have between the plate on the base of the cooler and the IHS or the integrated heat spreader on top of the CPU. And so it doesn't need to be super thick, doesn't need to be all globby. That's about perfect right there. So let's get our heat sink mounted. Our heat sink here has a little thing that says, warning, just a sticker. This sticker is only there to protect that beautifully lapped and, and polished end. So that guy's gonna go in there. Keep in mind, again, we have the, the mounting plate for this cooler pass through these holes right here. Let's talk about like how you mount this, the heat sink and orientation wise in your motherboard. This is the back of the case right here, right? This is where, the, where your IOs are. And there's gonna be typically a spot for a case fan to pull air out. So you'd logically wanna mount the fan pointed away from that so that the air that's being pulled through the heat sink is being pushed out towards that fan in the back. So in that case, we'd mount this guy like that. That should make sense, right? So mount it like this, the air's gonna come in one side, it's gonna go out the other, and it's gonna be great. So this Cooler Master heatsink needs to have these brackets mounted, which we're gonna do real fast. So do that, we'll pop this off. Move this over just a little bit. This got these big fan retention clips, push these down, and then the fan magically comes off. We're gonna take these brackets and they're gonna set like this. Screw in from the bottom, it looks like so. Cool, now, those are all mounted, as you can see. And we are gonna take this guy and put it on there. So, this is silly to say this, but I just wanna say it because it's one of those things. It's like, there's a logo on top of this. It says Cooler Master, right? So, this board is gonna sit, with this being the top of the case right here, over on this side. So, make sure that when you put and you mount this in there because you could mount it any direction you like. Maybe you should mount it with the with the logo facing the right direction because that'll look nice instead of having to be the wrong direction. So we're gonna take this. Cooler Master logo is gonna go just like 
my recommendation is to screw in so that they are attached. So it's not, so you, you've got everything on there and then kind of evenly go around it to try to get even distributed um, pressure on all four points. The more flat and even a, you know, a application of pressure on the top of your integrated heat spreader on the CPU, the better of a overall thermal performance you'll get. And you're gonna screw these till they stop screwing. Let me put RAM in this guy first. And because this is gonna be close, we wanna make sure the RAM's in first. RAM is keyed to go in a very specific way. And the location of this notch makes a difference. Also, you can see there's a little bit of a, of a cut in on these fingers here, and that's intentional so that you can rock it into place. And if you look down, it's, it might be a little hard to see where you're at, but these sockets, you can only put the RAM in a certain si or a certain way. And so when you do it, make sure that you are not going the wrong direction and forcing it in there. These guys are gonna happily slide in. And these dim sockets or dim slots are different than others. These guys don't move, they're, they're static, but these guys do move. So when you're ready, you just push in one side, then the other, and you hear it go click, click, and it's done. That's all there is to it. If it doesn't go in, don't push harder because you're gonna have a bad time. Boom. Now we'll, have, we'll mount that fan. Your fan has a direction. You can look either, a lot of these fans will have the orientation and direction, you know, rotation, direction, and the way that the air flows through as an indicator on the sides of them. But also it is usually a safe bet, unless there's something special about them, that if you can see the blades, that's where it's pulling air in. This, this is the back side of the fan. Air is coming out of this side. So we want to blow air through this cooler. So we're gonna mount it so that the, the spinny pot is facing forward. Very first, like this. And then we're gonna pull these, these retention clips from the back. That's it. This guy here is our PWM power connector that runs the power for the fan. And it actually goes, your motherboard has a very, uh, side note, your motherboard has a very specific port just for the heatsink fan uh, fan connection because it is paying very close attention to the RPM speed of this fan because if that fan stops working, the risk to the damage to the CPU is very high. Now your CPU will, will clock itself down and do a bunch of self-protection mechanisms when, the, uh, um, when it gets too hot. But this motherboard is designed to pay attention, close attention to the output of this connector. And on this board, it's right there. It says CPU fan one. So we're just gonna, again, everything is, I wanna say pinned or designed to go a specific way. And then we'll just take and tuck this cable. Side note, in case you're concerned, the plastics that they coat the wiring in is actually quite resistant to heat. So while you don't want the thing to be sitting on top of the CPU, which gets crazy hot, nesting or you know shoving this cable back underneath here is not going to make that plastic melt. It's meant for high temperatures, so it's a safe place. Okay, that part's done. This is our NVMe slot. It's kind of hard to see. We'll push back a little bit here so you can kind of see it. That's the NVMe slot. And we are going to mount our swordfish into it. This motherboard has a variety of different mounting spots for different sized uh, NVMe discs. So we need to get out of the motherboard box. There's going to be a very specific screw. And they look different because the locking mechanisms are different for different boards. Some just give you a screw. Some already have the standoffs built in. This is a full length. So we're gonna use the absolute last mounting spot. So we'll take this guy and we're gonna screw it in. There she is. This goes in actually remarkably easy. So it is keyed as well. This is called an M key. That's what this little slot's for. Um, and it only goes in one direction. Slide it in at a slight angle till you feel it slip into the uh, location. Just enough tension on the screw to keep it in place. We don't need to go crazy and like really rank it down. So there it is, sitting there happily set up and ready to go. And that's really all there is to that. Now we are officially done with this part and now we can put it into the case. So John and I are gonna clean up the space here, get the case out 
and we'll show you what to do with the case first before we throw the motherboard into it. If you can't afford a really nice case, don't feel bad because the case is there just to hold your stuff and as long as it's sturdy, doesn't have a whole lot of flex to it, it'll do you fine, right? Um, but obviously with everything, the more money you put into it, the better of a case you're gonna get. Anyway, this case is what's gonna hold all of our components. So we'll get to it. Let's talk about the inside of it. All cases are designed to adhere to specific form factors. So here the term ATX or MATX or ITX, those are all different standard form factors that define where the mounting holes are, where your ports go, all those things are standardized so that anybody in the world can make a computer case. And if you are building an ATX computer, you can buy an ATX form factor motherboard and put it into an ATX case and not have to worry about things not lining up, things not working right. This case has got a bunch of different mounts for a bunch of different things. There's other supporting things for more hard disks over here and all that kind of stuff. But we only have our NVMe and that's all we need to worry about. Um, when we put this motherboard in, we have to do a few things. One, we have to check to make sure that we've got, these are called standoffs, these little guys here. We need to make sure that we have all the standoffs in place because you don't put the motherboard against the metal inside. You put the motherboard where the mounting holes are on these standoffs and that keeps the motherboard lifted off of the bottom of the metal case so there's no connection between you know, the components and the metal. The back of this thing is the I.O. slot where the I.O. shield goes. And I.O. shield actually is something that comes with the motherboard. It doesn't come with the case because it's specific to the port cluster. This is an I.O. shield. Every I.O. shield is typically unique to the, like I said, the port cluster that's on your motherboard. Different motherboards have different ports, different features that you paid for. And so there's not just one generic I.O. shield to rule them all. There's one specific to each model of your motherboard. Some expensive motherboards have the IO shield built in already, so you just drop it in, it's already there. The cheaper you go with the motherboards, the more likely you're just gonna get a metal IO shield like this. And you are just going to take this, you'll notice that there's little ridges on this guy, and it goes back here like this. I'll move out of the way in a second so I can get it in there. And it has little, little detents to hold it in. And it sits like that. And when we put the motherboard in, this is flexible intentionally so that we'll press against it and that'll add connectivity for shielding because that's what it is to do is to shield and keeps the ground across everything, cuts down the amount of noise that might be affecting your ports and the things you connect to it. This case already has standoffs mounted in here, but these standoffs are in locations for an ATX board and this is an MATX board. So we need to actually take these and move them over a little bit. So that's what we're gonna do. To do that, we need to get out our handy dandy screwdriver set. We have a specific socket size to remove these. They just screw in. So we're gonna attempt to unscrew them. These are the standoffs we just removed and we're gonna move them to right here and right there for our MATX board. So, and they just down in here. Um, one other side note, some cases, it might be a little hard to see, but some cases your IO slot covers are actually punch outs and they're integrated into the case um, as a way to, to save money and cost in manufacturing. Those are complicated because you have to bend them out and they can scratch a motherboard after you put the motherboard in. So this case doesn't, these are fully removable and replaceable IO slot covers. So we don't have to worry about that, which is good. Okay, we've got our um, standoffs in the right location. So let's get our motherboard mounted into this guy. Your case should also come with some sort of bag of goodies. And it's gonna be extra standoffs and screws for mounting motherboards and other things. And this one's also coming with a few uh, zip ties, which is good, because we'll need that for cable management. One word of just useful caution Many a times I have put together a computer and had to struggle with finding the right screw for the standoffs because different screws can have different pitches, right? So different uh, amounts of threads. And so I find it to be immensely useful to check and test. So here's a, here's a, stand, a spare standoff that comes with it. We just want to make sure that it screws in and that this is the right screw for the job because cross threading is a bad deal. So that just screws right in and that's the right size. So now you know what the correct screws are for mounting a motherboard. 
different cases are different. Okay, let's do this. What do you say, John? Good. When you bring it in, make sure that you're not bending any of these parts of the IO shield the wrong way. And we discovered something. This guy's in the wrong spot. We're gonna move it over so we get it in the right spot. All right, let's do this again. Get the motherboard in. Make sure when you're putting it in to be very aware of these little pieces of metal here that are adding resistance and keeping connection on the IO shield so you don't get one into some place you don't want. Boom, just like that. Now we will go ahead and screw in our motherboard. Light pressure, I'm gonna push just so you can see where your screw holes are. There's not a right first screw to do. I like to try to get the one that's more center of the board just to kind of create a, a central point. And I also don't screw them down all the way every time. I wait till I've got all the screws mounted before I screw everything down tight because there will be tolerances and differences as you can see right here maybe how when I push on this, this one moves around a little bit. So we wanna make sure that we get a little bit of give on these for screwing down tight. This board has three across the kind of the top middle-ish and then three across the bottom, six total to mount. Other side note, John, I tell you what, having at least a lightly magnetized tip for a screwdriver, real nice. And it's not gonna damage anything. So having a slightly magnetized screwdriver is not going to destroy anything. We don't live in a world anymore <clears throat> where a magnetic screwdriver can destroy a floppy disk. So that's kind of, that was the last screw. So we'll go ahead and tighten things down nice and tightly now. Don't screw things down to where you hear it cracking and popping, please. <laughs> That's too much. A respectable amount of, of tension is, is good, but not too much tension where you're actually going to cause damage to something. Just like that, friends. Motherboard is mounted in the case and we are ready to... Wow, let's see, let's get the, let's get the front I.O. Cables plugged in, rainbow wires, all that kind of good stuff. Let's get to that next. Every case has got ports, and those ports are connected to the motherboard via headers that are on the board. And these wires have a variety of purposes. These blue guys like this with this high density, this is a USB 3.0 port. The blue USB ports that you're used to seeing. This guy right here is gonna be the high definition audio. And all these things have little little notches and keys to make them go one direction. Like you can see this guy's missing a plug right there. And this is a USB 2.0 port header. So we'll plug in the USB 2 header on the board. These guys right here are what we lovingly used to call rainbow wires. This case does something kind of interesting. They're all black, they're not rainbow wires, but they changed and made the these headers rainbow colored. And this is a hard disk or hard disk LED light. This is going to be, what is this? this they all even label, look at this. Power, power plus um, for LEDs, reset switch and power switch. And we need to pass these through and connect them to the motherboard, which we're gonna do right now. So your case, whatever you chose, might have a big old bundle of these or it might have less than what you see here. So it just depends on the case you buy. So let's get that done now. I've already passed these through um, based on where the locations of these headers are in the motherboard. This is our USB 2.0. This is our rainbow wires for the power and reset and LED lights. And this is our audio header, header that we were just talking about right there. And up here is the USB 3 port, which is gonna get plugged in right there. Okay, here comes the fun part. This little cluster of, of pins here is the rainbow wires header. And they're typically in a standard location but you're gonna to have to refer to your motherboard manual for what goes where because there'll be a little diagram in it that tells you where things are. Keep in mind that I guess I'm trying to get, get through to you is that different motherboards might have different pin locations and all that kind of fun stuff. So don't just make an assumption, check. We'll do the USB 3 header first because it's right here and it's kind of out of the way. Just kind of gently rock it into place. Should click in. That's done. Now we've got USB 3.0 ports on the front of the case that are connected to the board. Woo! Cool. 
Let's get this guy since it's, we'll get the easy ones out of the way. This is a USB 2.0 port header and we have a J USB right here. Again, like I was mentioning, they have pins that are blocked on this. So they only go one way. So you can't screw it up and put things in the wrong direction, which is very nice. Just kind of rocks into place like so. And that's done. And back down here is our audio header for the audio ports on the front of the case. That is also pinned very specifically and it goes right here. Generally speaking, you will find that these locations of headers are in the same place on basically all motherboards because they're effectively part of the reference design for the boards. So even though your board layout and features may be very different, you will start to see the more computers you build that you find things in very uh, specific and typical locations. Okay, rainbow wire time. This is the fun stuff. Um, all right, let's do the rainbow wires. Like I said, this little diagram right there explains what goes where, and this is the header for all of them right there. So let's take a look here and see. Our first one we're gonna do here is going to be, I gotta look in there and see, excuse my head, power LED and then power switch. Okay, so we'll take a look at these guys here. We'll find a power switch and our power LED. And LEDs have a positive and, and negative, so to speak, but electricity only flows one direction in an LED. So if you get them backwards, they're not gonna burn out, but they just won't work. So if your LED lights are not working after you plug them in, it's cause you got them backwards. And they go like this, this, there's two. The hard disk LED power switch goes next to them. The fun part of this is trying to keep them in, in place while you're moving around. Okay, that takes care of those two. Followed by a hard disk LED, which is the next one at the bottom. Where's the plus on this guy right there? Yes, it's hard to see what I'm doing. Take your time and just pay attention to the way the, the headers are labeled. Yeah, exactly. Like John said, it may not even say plus or minus. It just might be an arrow to indicate that this is the plus or the positive side. Fundamentally speaking, that's all we need to do for this. Now I think we can get to the fun stuff, which is let's get our GPU mounted. Time to do the fun thing and get this bad boy here installed into our motherboard in this case. This is our Zotac GeForce 3060 GPU. It has a single eight pin power connector, which is great. And we will provide that after we get the power supply mounted and the wires through that, for that through. But this guy is a two slot, meaning it takes two full slots, right? And so we need to pop out two slots here, but typically what you wanna do is you wanna just kind of guess, set it in there to, to, to guesstimate which IO slots you wanna remove, because it's gonna be the top two in this case. So we'll set this down. We'll get out our handy dandy screwdriver and we'll unscrew. One. And two. Again, like John had made me mention, that depending on your case, you might have knockouts instead of free replaceable uh, IO slot covers and your knockouts can cause damage because you have to wiggle them back and forth to get them out and that can be a problem. So check that first because you don't want to scratch your motherboard. That would be a bad thing. Okay, this is a nice little small card and really easy to maneuver inside here. Some of the bigger GPUs are more of a pain in the butt, but uh, this little tab back here is the retention tab for the PCI Express 16X slot. Pop that back and we will Line it up to make sure that the slot is in the right spot. And repeatedly say, never force something in. If it doesn't seem like it wants to go in, don't force it. That went in perfectly. And this is a this is a relatively light card. It's not super heavy. The bigger GPUs with more metal on them when we set this case up would wanna kind of bend over. And in that case, you wanna make sure you get everything lined up because so you don't put too much excess stress. That's perfect. And we will go ahead and put these mounting screws back in, back here, to make sure that we 
Don't lose this when we set it up. G-Force 3060 in our brand new build, looking good. Next stop is to get our power supply mounted right here, get all of the power cables plugged into the board, to the GPU, and then we're ready to power it up and start using this system. I mean, we're gonna install Windows and all that stuff too, which, which we'll just uh, skip over. <laughs> Be like, Windows, just like that. Okay, let's get our Cooler Master 550 watt power supply installed in this case. As a side note, the power supply has a air intake fan on one side, and that is for cooling the inside of the power supply. That gets put in with the fan facing the bottom of the case, where there is a opening and a little mesh filter there to catch dust and things from coming into it. That's how it pulls air in, blows it out to keep it cool. Let's throw it in there now. It goes in like this, and we'll drop it in there. I will go around the other side and install. Let's take a quick minute and talk about the types of power connections that you have in a computer because they have names and it's important to know what they are. So when you're plugging them in, you know where they go. This guy is very famously known as the ATX power connector. This is a 24 pin connection. All of these plugs here have different shapes so they can only go into the locations that they're meant to go and you can't get them backwards. So you don't need to worry about getting something wrong and making things explode. That's not how it always used to be, but that's how it is these days, which is great. So this is an ATX power connector. This next guy here is a auxiliary 12 volt CPU power connection. And this is the one that goes on that port that's at the top of the board. This guy here is eight pin. They're all shaped specifically for it. This guy here, there's actually two sets here. These are for GPU. These are GPU connections, also known as PCIe power, which because the GPU goes in the PCI Express slot, PCIe power, makes sense. This guy here is known as a SATA power connector and it goes into a power port that's for a SATA device, like a SATA hard disk. These good old fashioned guys right here, these four pin big thick chonkers are called Molex connectors and they are 12 volt and five volt and they go for older types of peripherals. You might see older hard disks, like big mechanical hard drives that don't use SATA. Um, and you know, powering things like RGB uh, things and cases and whatnot. And that makes up the ports that you have for power. Now let's go ahead and route these through to the different locations that they belong to get this thing built. Okay, the easiest way I have found to prepare uh, to get your power connections done is to have the case down and then push through the cables, power cables where you need to go and then worry about cable management afterwards. So. ATX power connector is closest to the motherboard up there, so we'll put it in that spot. Um, next is our GPU pass through, or GPU power, excuse me. GPU power will push through one of these little openings underneath here that will allow us to get to the GPU from the inside. We don't have any ATX, or excuse me, we don't have any SATA connections, so we don't need to worry about SATA power or the Molex power. So we will take these guys and we're just gonna collect them all and just kind of unceremoniously stuff them down there. And then this guy, which is our auxiliary 12 volt power for the, the, the CPU, we'll go through here, up here, if we can get it through easily. And Try to get through there. Cool. Cool. Now we got all this stuff kind of best organized. So we're going to flip the case over and start plugging in devices. Get ready. Remember, we have really only three spots that we got to plug stuff in. We've got the auxiliary power for the, the CPU. We've got the ATX connector right here for the motherboard, and then we've got power for our GeForce RTX 3060. So we'll start with the hardest one to do, and that's usually, depending on the way your case is designed, how much space is, is the auxiliary power. This guy right here goes through and like that. That's all there is to that. That takes care of power for the uh, CPU. Absolutely necessary. Computer's not gonna be without it. Over here to the ATX power connector. Again, 
all of these can only go in one way. So you're not gonna get in the wrong direction. But as I've said a billion times now, if it doesn't seem like it wants to go in, don't force it. So we'll flip this guy around. And that's how it goes inside there like that. And then we're just gonna kind of rock it in because it's a big connector. connector. Last, but certainly not least, is our GPU. And we have the power cable that I passed through this opening on the bottom. Now this guy has uh, a total of 16 or two, two sets of eight here. And because some graphics cards will take two eight port connections or eight, eight pin connections, ours only needs a single eight. So we'll just use this for this one out. They don't, I mean, these are, it doesn't matter which set you use. That's the other question is, what well, do I use one over the other? No, they're just, they're all the same. Um, but this one does, however, have a little uh, breakout of two pins here because some GPUs only use six pins instead of eight. So that's why there's an option. So we'll get these guys together like that, rotate it around. It goes in like that. That's where it goes and a little bit of a push. And we don't hear it click on this one. There it goes. There you go. And that's it. Guys, we just built a computer start to finish. Everything's plugged in. The next thing to do is sometimes the most scariest thing, which is plug it in to power, press the button and see if she boots up. We got it built. Everything's plugged in and ready. Let's get the monitor and power supply plugged in and let's boot it up and see if it boots. Let's take a quick moment and talk about what to check just overall in case your system doesn't boot. First things first, if you press the button on the top of the case and it doesn't boot up, check your ramble wires, make sure your power switch is in the right pins so that the thing boots fine. Then go over the board, make sure that all of your power connectors are nice and seated. Make sure that your GPU is seated well in the slot. Again, don't push too hard. Check the RAM. Just make sure everything that you put together is in the right spot and that you're getting power to the board and then <laughs> check to make sure that the switch in the back of your power supply is also on too. All right, let's do some cable management. This case is very, very bare bones. Your case might have a whole bunch of other features like RGB controllers and stuff like that. And you might have a lot of cables or like us, you might not have that much at all. Also, our power supply is not modular, meaning that all of the cables are physically attached to the inside of the power supply. So we have a big wad of cables back there, which is okay. So don't feel bad if you are worried about just having a big chunk of cables just stuffed in there. But we do want to go ahead and move cables around and kind of fix them down with zip ties. Now, our case, came with zip ties. Yours may not have. You can use any zip ties. You can buy them off Amazon. You know, they're all over the place. So go down to the hardware store. So cases typically have mounting locations for you to loop your, your zip ties through. And that's what we're going to use to affix these wires. And we're going to get to it right now. All right, let's check out how well it performs playing Fortnite and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, two games that I'm terrible at. Starting with Fortnite, at 1080p, with all settings cranked to max, Fortnite played incredibly well, averaging anywhere between 110 to 180 frames per second, which is absolutely fantastic. And in Warzone at 1080p, we see well over 100 frames a second with liquid smooth gameplay throughout. The RTX 3060 card easily handled both games without breaking a sweat and looked good doing it. Unfortunately for me, that did nothing for my terrible game playing skills. All right, now that you finished this video, may I recommend you check out this other playlist of other great build videos we've done in the past. If you're looking to get into PC building, we can help you out.